Welcome, everyone, to the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. My name is Eric McLaughlin. I am the astronomer here. And we're going to have some fun exploring the universe here tonight. But as we're getting going here, I want to note one thing, and that is I want to give a special thanks to a few things. First, to Ron Treat, who helped a lot with the setup of this uh, slideshow here. And also a special thank you to the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory Foundation. It is through that foundation that we're able to offer these, uh, these types of events here to you for completely free of charge. So a special thank you to the foundation for making events like this possible. And now let's actually uh, start working our way a little bit further away from this planet here by actually going and visiting some islands in the sky. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'll explain as we go. So yes, we're going to be talking about galaxies. And it's a good question of what is a galaxy? Well, you might have some particular ideas that are associated with this term. A lot of people might think of their phone right off the bat. Others might, <clears throat> might think of LA's soccer team. Uh, those who like video games might remember Super Mario Galaxy. There's all sorts of things that reference galaxies, but I've played that game, and there was one frustrating aspect, and it was that they didn't seem to understand what the term actually meant. Uh, they would put a bunch of planets and call it a galaxy. It's not it. So what is a galaxy not? What a galaxy is not, in other words, well, one thing it's not is it's not a individual solar system. It's not a set of one star with planets orbiting around it. Uh, we have a lot of those, and it takes a lot of those to make up a galaxy. So let's go ahead and actually delve more into detail on all the intricacies of this particular word and what it means. So what are galaxies actually? Well, a galaxy can really be thought of as a vast array of on the order of, say, millions to over a trillion stars, all gravitationally bound, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes with those stars typically, lots of gas and dust and planets and stellar remnants and all sorts of things that tend to actually form some very specific shapes, as we'll find out. Now, it is worth noting where this term came from. Uh, the big stretch of sky you might have seen if, you're in a, uh, if you've been here at the right time for our stargazing events or have been to a really dark sky and stayed up through the night, you may have seen the Milky Way as a big stretching uh, fuzzy stripe across the sky. And in fact, uh, there's always some fun things to note with that. Yeah, in some places when there are significant power outages, that can becomes very apparent. And there's a story that the Milky Way, that big stripe across the sky, in LA when there was a significant power outage, some people thought it was a uh, smoke from a fire and they actually called 911 on it. So <laughs> even though it's something that's visible here from this planet, it's still easy to get it confused with things. So what were they actually looking at? Yeah, it's this sort of milky looking stripe across the sky and that's where the term galaxy comes from. It's from the Greek galaxias, which basically uh, is referring to gala, milk, uh, is really and what it's talking about there. So along those lines, how did our idea of the galaxy actually develop? Well, back in the age of Aristotle in 360 BC, well, he was able to actually look up and he thought, well, maybe this big stripe is actually between the Earth and the Moon. It's uh, not exactly something that makes sense, as was pointed out uh, actually quite a little ways after that. Uh, and he could easily say, based on what is called parallax, that the galaxy that he looks up at at the sky is not between us and the Moon. What is parallax? I always make this reference. Parallax is what your eyes use to give you depth perception. You can test this if you hold your hand out in front of me, or in front of you, and blink with one eye and switch with eye is open, you'll be able to actually see your finger move with respect to where I am, the background. That is how you actually perceive depth by having two different perspectives on the universe. And so, oh goodness, trying to pronounce that name, Olympio Doris uh, was able to actually go and say, based on parallax measurements, we can easily say that the 
Milky Way galaxy is not between us and the moon. Uh, and so moving right along to the age of Galileo, he was able to actually use a telescope because he was the first to really use a telescope for astronomical observations. He looked around and was able to see that that big stripe of stars actually wasn't just a haze in the universe, it was actually a haze of stars. Actual point sources of light scattered all through that big milky stripe. And then moving on forward, we had Thomas Wright uh, talking about the Milky Way and actually thinking about it as a gravitationally bound body of stars moving in such a way similar to the way the solar system actually works with the sun at the center and planets orbiting around it. Maybe these stars are actually orbiting around the common center of gravity of all of these stars. This is a very important and worthwhile way of actually looking at this that we'll come back to a bit more as we go. But there was another model that came not there long after, made mostly by a couple of uh, wonderful uh, brother and sister pair of Caroline and William Herschel. They were uh, looking out the Milky Way and were actually counting stars and trying to figure out distances to them. And they worked to make that map that is shown on the far right of the screen there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Their uh, actual view of the universe, again, it had to be centered on the solar system because that was where they were making their measurements from. There is one thing uh, that they really couldn't account for, and it has a fun name. It's known as Malmquist biased, bias. And what is that? Basically, it's a way of saying that, look, there's actual objects that we can see that are closer by. If they are dimmer, we can see them. If they're further away, well, we can only see the really bright objects. If you have bright objects that are far away, you can see them. If you have dim objects that are far away, you won't see them. Up close, you can see both of them, but dim objects far away, you won't see them. So, when they're actually looking out there, yeah, eventually there's a limit to how far they can see based on how bright those objects are. So, yeah, they might have been missing a few details there, but uh, nevertheless, they were able to discover many different things, including over 2,400 nebulae, big clouds of gas and dust uh, that are thought to be inside the Milky Way. Uh, and also, when Talking about nebula in this sense, nebula literally just means a sort of cloud, and at that time, virtually anything that looked sort of hazy and cloud-like would be referred to as a nebula. So over time, uh, these things that we now refer to as galaxies, they wouldn't have been called galaxies. They would have been called things like spiral nebula and such. So that is what we thought of for the existence of the entire universe for some time, was this funny blob-shaped pancake that the Herschels were able to uh, figure out and that there are some spiral nebulae. But over time, we were able to actually see with newer and better instruments that some of those objects, well, those nebulae have a lot of stars in them. And how far away are they actually? Some started to posit that they might actually be outside the Milky Way. There were some measurements that uh, were actually mistakenly done in some sense that actually indicated that they were a lot closer. But uh, advanced to the 1900s, when we had Edwin Hubble, he was able to determine some wonderful things. Uh, what he was actually looking at is, again, looking at those big uh, nebulae, and he was the one who was really able to actually open our view on the universe and actually see these uh, individual things, again, these individual clouds, as being comparable to the entire our entire view of the universe at the time. Again, think back to Caroline and William Herschel's model of the Milky Way. That was our entire universe for some time. When we actually find that there are other things like our Milky Way out there, we can refer to them as that island universe. And that's where we get to that islands in the sky idea. But in order to actually figure that out, what did he have to do? Well, he had this notion that the Andromeda galaxy was, at the time, the Andromeda spiral nebula, was actually outside the bounds of the Milky Way. And when looking at it, he decided he would look for novae, that is, stars that are actually uh, bursting and getting very bright due to certain uh, physical processes that are beyond the scope of the current talk. I'd love to talk about it, though. Uh, but the processes there are worth noting, but he was also uh, 
when he was looking at that set of nebula, or novae, he was able to actually spot something in particular. And in particular, it was some research that he was familiar with, research done by Henrietta Swan Leavitt. She was able to determine that certain variable type stars can be used as a means of measuring distance. How does that actually work out? Well, you can think about it this way. Uh, say you had two lights that were flashing at a given rate. You have ones that get bright and dim in a one second time frame. If you have one of those identical light sources nearby, it's going to be very bright. One further away, it's going to be very dim. Now, imagine that that time frame in which it gets brighter and dimmer actually determines the maximum brightness it actually gets. So the longer it takes for it to get brighter and dimmer, the brighter it is. So if you have something going very fast in, in uh, oscillation, it's going to be overall intrinsically dimmer. And if you have something that's very slow, it's going to be intrinsically brighter. So if you have then something that's right nearby, going the same rate as something further away, the further away object will appear dimmer, and using some careful math, you can actually figure out how much further away that's, that identically oscillating object is. And that is uh, really worthwhile, and in fact, it is a very exciting thing. In particular, it was really exciting for Edwin Hubble. When he was looking at the Andromeda Spiral Nebula, he was looking for novae, which he's marked here on this slide, and then he figured out one of those novae he saw was actually a variable star. You can see, literally, he put the exclamation point there. He realized how important this discovery was. And in fact, he was able to actually calculate the distance to the Andromeda Spiral Nebula in such a way that put it definitively far beyond the reach of the Milky Way galaxy. Notably, he was quite a ways off, but that is not his fault. There is a lot of different measurement things. That is a glass plate he was measuring off of. That makes it more difficult. And also the fact that, again, when it comes to calibrating that measurement system, it takes a lot of effort. So, yeah. He may not have gotten it exact, but he was able to definitively show that it was outside the Milky Way, and that changed our view of the entire universe. Because once he was able to use that method uh, when looking at our closest large neighbor, uh, he was actually able to do that on a number of other galaxies, and was actually able to show that it's not just a universe of us here and maybe Andromeda, but also it was a matter of the Milky Way is one of many galaxies, many universes in a sense. Again, everything we knew was in, that was in the universe was found inside the Milky Way, so finding other things that are intrinsically similar to the Milky Way, he was able to, def to definitive, definitively show that those objects were very similar to our own Milky Way, having their own set of everything we find in this universe. So, uh, what he was also able to do when he was doing that was he was actually able to take some uh, other information that was de determined by a number, of other, a number of other scientists showing the velocities of these objects, which eventually led to figuring out how the universe is actually expanding, and that leads to the theory of the Big Bang. <clears throat> All right, so... Uh, there was a number of other things. Again, the way he actually did that is he figured out that the further away an object was, the faster it was receding from us in general. And as such, what we're kind of looking at, looking at is a, uh, uh, what appears very similar to kind of looking at an explosion. Something right near the center is going to be moving, uh, or things moving near the center of that explosion will be moving way slower than things that were moving that are further away. In other words, if you rewound all of that, all, all of the objects in the universe come back to the same point at the same time. That is really the notion of the Big Bang in, in its initial uh, formulation. It's not a big explosion. It's really an expansion of space and time itself, but that is, again, uh, another more detailed topic for another day. But again, the way this was actually validated was by actually looking at redshift, and that is according to Doppler effect. Again, if uh, I could go into detail on Doppler effect, I'll just uh, go ahead and make the classic note of, can anyone tell me what does it sound like when a car drives by? Very good, all right. 
that tonal shift is associated with what's called the Doppler effect. A high frequency as the object is approaching, it goes to its actual rest frequency as it passes, and then it goes to a lower frequency as it's receding away from us. That happens perfectly well with sound. It also happens that way with light. And with light, red light is at a lower frequency than blue light, so an object moving towards us has its frequency increased, it is blue shifted. As something is moving away from us, it has its frequency of light emitted from it appear apparently decreased, it is red shifted. And so with a set of measurements of a number of different galaxies, he was able to actually plot out a very rough uh, way of showing that the, the universe is actually expanding. The distances between all the galaxies is inherently getting larger. <clears throat> all right, so where do we go from there? Well, all right, well, Hubble went to the Hooker Telescope uh, up on Mount Wilson and actually studied a lot more Cepheid variables up there and actually got a better understanding of that distance there. And again, Andromeda, Triangulum Galaxy, and the other spiral nebula, that was where he was focusing his time. And this is where we actually managed to start seeing some other patterns, not just patterns of how things are moving, but patterns in shape. This is what could be referred to as morphology, the study of shape, uh, galactic morphology to be specific. And eventually he was actually able to make himself a diagram of how he thought galaxies evolved. That is referred to as the tuning fork diagram. And what on earth does that look like? It looks like a tuning fork, like that. Uh, and so what he actually thought was that you'd start with these elliptical, very featureless galaxies and over time would uh, get flattened out and form spiral arms and such. It's not actually how it happens, but that's how he thought it happens. Uh, so to this day, you will actually hear astronomers refer to these types of galaxies as early types and these types as late types. It has nothing to do with time and it, it's actually at best backwards but really, it's not even just backwards, it's more complicated. So, uh, there's a whole thing when it comes to uh, notation and such in astronomy. There are some uh, habits and traditions that take a little bit of time, or a lot of time really, to work out of our nomen nomenclature. So again, if you hear me referring to uh, the ellipticals as early type galaxies, it's because of all of that. Uh, Nonsense. Anyway, uh, yes, so he was classifying them by the shapes he saw on the photographic plates. Again, ellipticals are those very smooth and relatively featureless galaxies. They look like a roughly elliptical distribution of stars. Uh, and then there are lenticulars, basically ones that look like a lens type shape. No really distinct, uh, distinct arm patterns or anything, just a big flat disk. And then there are two types of spirals, the general spiral shape and then barred spiral galaxies. And when we're talking about a barred spiral, we're talking about literally that little bar right at the center of that galaxy that extends from the central bulge of the galaxy. That is literally all we're talking about there. And then those are subcategorized based on how loosely or tightly the arms are actually wound. This is a little exaggerated, but shows uh, things like uh, type A is more tightly bound than type B is more tightly bound than type C, and uh, so on for others. Now, there are another set of galaxies other than what's here. They're referred to as irregular galaxies. They are irregular. Uh, they're messy. They really don't look like a simple type of thing, and there's good reason to that and I'll touch base on that a little bit later. <clears throat> All right, so going back to the arms though, there are some problems when it comes to arms. We want to actually understand what it is we're looking at with those arms, and when we're looking at the rotation of uh, objects, these things don't rotate like a solid plate. It's not like I can actually just spin around here with my arms out. That is not what we're talking about here because they don't move like a solid object. These are freely floating objects orbiting around the center due to gravitational forces. It's not a solid structure, and as such, things further out are expected to move a bit slower around than the things towards the center. 
So going from there, yes, rotation time for objects near the core, it's going to be very short. That stuff will whip around very fast compared to the stuff out on the far outer reaches of the galaxy. So again, rotation time, in other words, takes longer as you go further out from the core. And so what we're actually talking about is in a relatively short time, those, if those arms are actually uh, physical structures made of physical material that persists throughout the orbital ro rotation of this galaxy, then what we can expect is that those arms will get really tightly wound over time, and in the, a relatively short span of millions of years, yes, relatively short span of millions of years, those arms should dissipate. And as such, we really shouldn't see many of these galaxies, but we see a lot. Uh, and in fact, that means that these arms really need to be able to be stable for billions of years at a time. And so, how do we address this winding problem? The problem of galaxies' arms should be winding up. To make sure you understand what this is looking like, this is an example of what we're talking about for what the winding problem looks like. If these are all physical objects here that are persistent and we just have more of them in the brighter portions there, over time, as this thing runs along, you'll actually see that the arms get more and more tightly wound and given enough time, say a few hundred million years, a few year over a billion years, you aren't even gonna notice those arms anymore. They're gonna get so mixed together that you're just gonna end up with a flat disk. We, don't, we see too many spiral galaxies for that to be the case. So how do we address this problem? Well, there's two parts to, this, uh, to answering this question. And the first is density wave theory. Uh, density wave theory is literally talking about uh, basically a wave of density in much the same way that sound is a density wave, or rather a pressure, pressure wave, truly. Uh, so how does that actually work out? Well, let's uh, talk about more of the details again. The arms are there, and the term here, quasi-static, is basically saying, all right, well, if we actually look at the positioning of the arms with respect to themselves, they should appear stationary. They should just stay there. And while they might rotate in our reference frame, there exists a rotating reference frame in which that galaxy should appear absolutely stationary, at least the arms of the galaxy should be. And so what we're talking about in this sense is that the arms are actually areas where there is a greater density of material. What does that actually mean? Well. The stars, gas, and dust actually pass through these areas of greater density and then go back to other spaces that are not. Uh, and when you have that gas and dust being compressed, that is where you get star formation. And as such, when looking at a galaxy like this, where we would expect to find star-forming nebulous regions would be right uh, in the arms. And in fact, those little fuzzy blobs you see over there should be a little nebula. But uh, what we can liken this to <clears throat> is actually a little bit of traffic. When we're actually talking about uh, cars moving through a traffic jam, as you drive up to a traffic jam, you'll come up to a higher density of cars. You slow down, uh, and then you actually deal with the fact of traffic, and then eventually you get to the other side of that density, and you move on. <clears throat> that is what it would be like to pass through an over-density. Now, we aren't actually talking about these stars necessarily slowing down too much, but the gas and dust can, and when that gas and dust slows down encountering that density, that is when it triggers that star formation. And so that is what we're looking at in essence there. And so stars' gravity at a different radii from the core can actually maintain these areas of density by actually just the way everything is moving, and the spiral arms can end up being uh, perpetuated for a long time. Again, it's a lot of weird details. It helps to actually just see this in motion. Here's an animation of it. Again, these little red dots are your star-forming regions. Uh, the brighter areas here are, uh, the brighter blue areas here would be the very hot, uh, large, massive, and short-lived stars. As those stars start to move out of the arms, they die off, and all you're left with are the dimmer stars throughout there. So, how does this actually look? It well, looks a bit like this. So you can actually see star formation in uh, certain spots there. You get some bright stars, they die off, and you're left with that dark space in between there. 
That is what density wave theory is really saying with regards to how you set up a galaxy like this. This works great in uh, many cases for spiral galaxies that look like this. This is what is called a grand design spiral galaxy. It has two nice spiral arms, but you don't necessarily need them to just have two arms. There are cases where you can have more and uh, where you can actually lose really a notion of arms themselves but still have a spiral structure in it. Uh, those are referred to as flocculent spiral galaxies, and density wave theory isn't quite enough to really make that work. Uh, and as such, there is a part two to the answer to this question, and that is to really talk about a fun thing called stochastic self-propagating star formation, or SSPSF, which I'm really not sure is any easier to say. Uh, but what we're talking, out here, talking about here is stars causing other stars to be formed through the deaths of other stars. Let me clarify that. Basically, you have uh, initial stars start to form out of uh, basic, uh, basic conditions there, and in particular from supernovae shock waves in the galaxy that cause gas and dust to compress together in such a way that you actually have star formation occurring. Those stars will, uh, after they form, will actually uh, grow old, uh, put out their own stellar winds that move material around, and then they will die, uh, the larger ones, with supernova explosions, producing their own shock waves, which can initiate star formation elsewhere. And so the actual differential rotation of the galaxy, another big term there, basically, again, what I was saying, the fact that it's not rotating like a big solid disk, the inner areas move at a different rate than the outer area's differential rotation, uh, actually drives that sort of spiral shape there. And the big note here is that unlike uh, density wave theory, this works not only well in flocculent spiral galaxies, it also can apply in other irregular galaxies and other uh, environments as well. It can even work in elliptical galaxies. So, say, Worthwhile thing to have both of these answers uh, as uh, likely solutions, and it's likely not one or the other in many cases. To some extent, it's likely often a little bit of both in galaxies. So what does, uh, what does this look like again? Well, here's a uh, up-close view. Again, what we're talking about here for this is you have a supernova, and that shock wave compresses gas and dust nearby. That gas and dust will then start forming new stars, and as those grow old, they will mature in such a way that they will blow away that material from near them, uh, the remaining material, and then the more massive ones, when they die, well, I can literally restart the video if you want and show you what happens after that. They explode and they put out a shockwave that causes star formation elsewhere. That is what we're talking about with SSPSF. All right, <clears throat> so there's more to talk about, though, when it comes to the actual way in which these things move. Yes, it's, it's not just a matter of material moving around. There's something else hidden below the surface, causing this majestic motion of these uh, galaxies, and that is dark matter. How do we actually get to uh, dark matter in this case? Well, there's a number of ways we actually came to this conclusion. In particular, when an object orbits around another object, you can actually weigh those objects by watching how they move. If an object is orbiting around a more massive object, it needs to orbit faster to be in a stable orbit. So, when we look at these things, we can actually note that when we see the matter there, the luminous matter from all the light from those stars, we actually don't necessarily see enough material there. Uh, in other words, the predicted motion based on the amount of light we see there is not equal to the observed motion. How do we actually measure the velocities of these things? Think back to that Doppler effect I mentioned. We can actually use that same uh, notion to actually measure how fast stars are moving around a galaxy. It works a lot better when they're not viewed at this angle. You want them more edge on than face on because then they will be moving towards you and away from you. So you get that blue shift and that red shift. So you can very carefully measure the distances or the speeds with which stars are orbiting around the center of that galaxy by looking at different parts of the galaxy. So when we do that, we can predict a motion uh, by actually uh, 
looking at the stars and estimating how much mass should be there based on the stars. And then when we observe that motion, we see that we need a lot more stuff there than is actually there. Uh, and so, yeah, when you look at stars and gases, they don't, they don't exactly orbit slower at those greater distances. It actually flats out in a rotation curve. It's not a, a, a pure uh, Keplerian system. That is, it doesn't fit exactly with what Kepler shows. So, what we're actually thinking then is that there is actually more material there. Uh, again, when we're talking about material, dark matter in its essence, the initial idea is that it's material that doesn't emit light. It's literally dark, as opposed to stars, which we can call luminous matter. So gas and dust should apply for it, but uh, when we actually uh, look at that application, as it were, uh, we see that it is lacking as there is not enough of that material. We can actually try to figure out how much of that material is there through a number of other wavelengths and such. We don't find enough normal material. And thus, we actually anticipate a halo. And then this term halo isn't a little ring over uh, part of it. No, it's a spherical distribution around that big uh, flat disk of stars there. That is referred to as the halo. And that halo should include a lot of invisible matter, matter that we literally don't see interacting in any other way uh, but via gravity. So that is uh, a good quick glance on what dark matter is, but it's worth knowing how we got there. Again, back in the 1930s, Fritz Zwicky actually looked at a particular galactic cluster, and when he was looking there, he noticed that uh, based on the actual motions of these things, uh, he had an estimate that uh, it should be about 400 times the amount of matter there than uh, what is actually seen. The actual uh, number might have been a little bit different, but still, it's a good first estimate to say there's not enough matter to begin with. And this matter is where we get that term dark matter, uh, and, or dunkel matter. Uh, again, just material that's not emitting light is the original idea. But uh, with further looking at the rest of the... Of uh, the universe, when it comes to matter itself, this is excluding a whole other thing called dark energy. Unfortunately, we won't have too much time to talk about dark energy. Again, lots of things, but uh, excluding dark energy, comparing that to normal everyday matter, the material uh, that we see here, this stuff is referred to as baryonic matter. Uh, it is also technically dark because it's not emitting light like stars, but nonetheless, again, we've been able to for, uh, force that out as an explanation for all this other material. So this invisible dark material, uh, it actually makes up a significant fraction of the universe, and depending on certain estimates, you can actually get an estimate of about 85% of the matter in this universe being at dark matter, whereas the remainder of that mass would be stuff like us, stuff like all the stuff in this room, baryonic matter, matter made up of protons and neutrons, and so on. Now, uh, one random side note, uh, if you've, you already heard me use the term supernova, it was a, 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 a term he actually coined, so it's a worthwhile thing to know. But that was not the only thing that drove our understanding of what dark matter is. Uh, there was another astronomer who came not long thereafter named Vera Rubin, and she was really good at measuring the rotation velocities of galaxies. Uh, this, again, that notion that the amount of material there uh, in a galaxy should cause a specific rotation curve. Based on the amount of light we see, we should be able to know how much matter is there. We don't see that, and that is one of the things she was really able to, uh, to provide definitive evidence for that problem, again, known as the galaxy rotation problem, uh, not to be confused with the winding problem mentioned earlier. This is the actual physical rotations. Again, we can look at the light of those stars and estimate the amount of light, or the amount of matter coming that is causing that uh, light to be there. Based on the star's mass, there's not enough matter in those stars, thus we see this as the main evidence, one of the best evidences 
for the existence of dark matter because we can actually go and weigh the amount of dark matter in individual galaxies using methods that she really, uh, she really championed in many ways. But she was not only a champion of just pure science, she was also an advocate for women in science. And in fact, when, and she was not only a mentor to many women astronomers, but she was also uh, notably when she was actually getting her, or starting her doctorate, doctoral studies, uh, she was, it was the first time she was actually pregnant, so uh, it is worth noting that idea that you have to choose between uh, pursuing a career or uh, a, a life in science or family life. She is a wonderful evidence that that is not always the case. That is not a, a choice that must be made. You can actually look at it other ways, and she was an excellent example of someone who was able to do that. But again, going back to her actual measurements that drove our, ver our idea of understanding that there is dark matter out there, she really should have gotten a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she passed away not long ago, and they do not offer those posthumously. Uh, but I will always reference that she was an amazing scientist who should have been better recognized uh, when she did all of her uh, measurements. Now, going back out of the halo, down deep into the galaxies, uh, looking towards the center. There's another dark thing, but it's not the same as dark matter. This dark thing is supermassive black holes. Supermassive black holes are found in, uh, or when we ever, whenever we look for them, we basically tend to find them. It's very uh, rare for us to even say, I'm not sure there was one there. We almost always certain every time we look at the center of a galaxy that we find a supermassive black hole. And what is that? Well, it's a tiny, dense region of space, uh, so dense that uh, light itself cannot even escape from it, hence the name black hole. The supermassive notion of it comes from the actual mass that's there, it can be on the order of thousands of times the mass of the sun, up to even billions of times the mass of the sun. And when we're actually looking at that, okay, that's, that's big, but let's put in some other terms. Uh, I could hold a kilogram in my hand, it's nice and easy. How massive is the sun? Well, it's about uh, two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. That is two with 30 zeros after it kilograms. That is the mass of the sun. Uh, and so when we're talking about the actual, uh, the actual things being billions of times that mass, it is absurd in some senses. There's a reason why these are called astronomical numbers. They are that big. <clears throat> All right, so when we're talking about black holes, it's always worth noting things like the event horizon, which literally is just talking about the point from which uh, nothing, absolutely nothing, not even light can escape from that object. And that event horizon defines out a, in general, a radius of an object, or of a, uh, uh, a black hole, and that's when we're talking about the size of a black hole, we're not actually talking about the size of the physical material, we're typically talking about the size of that event horizon. So, again, when looking at galaxies, it tends to be a matter of, uh, we know there's a uh, supermassive black hole at the center, or there might be, and so we can definitively say nearly all uh, large galaxies have superma supermassive black hole uh, evidence of one, so it's a, uh, it's a thing that will take more measurements in the future to really try and figure out uh, more directly. <clears throat> but there is a detailed mystery with regards to these objects, and that is those masses. Uh, when looking at uh, stars, like uh, ones that are much more massive than the sun, on the order of uh, being greater than eight to 10 times the mass of the sun, those types of stars will go through their lives, and they can often end their lives with a supernova, leaving behind either a neutron star or a stellar mass black hole. Stellar mass black holes tend to be about five to 10 times the mass of the sun, uh, but again, you might remember I just said that what's in the centers of, uh, of galaxies are much, much larger, so there's kind of a gap in between those, kind of a big gap, uh, and so, when we're looking out there, we've only really found a few black holes that we would refer to as intermediate mass black holes. And most of the time, those have been found using, again, what I'll mention on the next slide, uh, gravitational waves. So 
becomes a worthwhile question. How do you get these things? How do they actually form? And so, well, there's a few different ways of actually thinking about it. Uh, one is the seed version. That is, uh, shortly after the Big Bang, you have uh, material that actually accretes onto uh, supermassive black holes, rapidly beefs them up, makes them very, very uh, massive. And uh, when it comes to looking at those things, you could actually have multiple black holes merge together and emit gravitational waves. Again, I mentioned I would come back to gravitational waves. Uh, LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, it is uh, literally looking for gravitational waves. Uh, I was actually at the AAS meeting where the second discovery of a uh, gravitational waves was actually announced. I was actually in the, the press conference room. It was very fun. I carried the mic around. Anyway, uh, fun stuff there. Uh, and now we're at a point very rapidly where we have now are detecting these mergers on a, like a weekly basis. This is uh, phenomenal uh, because this will allow us to further understand and try and answer that question of how these things show up. Uh, but again, there's also this notion that before any stars formed, you could have large gas clouds that could actually uh, collapse rapidly and basically bypass that uh, star phase and go, uh, or sorry, the supernova phase and just go straight on past it. Uh, there's also this idea that uh, dark, matters, dark matter itself might actually drive quasar formation. Again, quasar is a whole other term referring to uh, quasi, uh, oh goodness, quasi stellar radio sources, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, but basically, quasars are referring to active galactic nuclei in many cases, uh, which are uh, big supermassive black holes. <clears throat> and then once you actually have stars forming near those things, the growth the growth of those objects could be actually driven by stars being consumed by those supermassive black holes. They get a little too close, get torn apart, some of that material falls in, the black hole gets bigger. Over the course of 13 billion years, you got enough time to get something supermassive. That is one notion there. All right. <clears throat> now, it is, again, known that these are growing objects. And when we're talking about an accretion disk, what we're talking about is material that is actually gravitationally bound. And if you actually have a big cloud of material orbiting around an object, uh, what ends up happening is the interaction of the gas with itself will drive it down into a flat plane. And that is a good disk that is accreting or collecting onto, or in this case, into uh, the object passing over the uh, event horizon and thus adding to the black hole's mass. Again, as I just mentioned, nearby stars, if they get a little too close, they might get a little torn apart and consumed. And then there's also worth noting that sometimes galaxies collide. And when galaxies collide, eventually those two supermassive black holes, they might get uh, uh, close enough together to eventually merge and thus really help you go from uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of times the mass of the sun rather quickly. That's one option there. But uh, again, there is the, also the notion of a thing called Hawking radiation, uh, uh, coined by uh, Stephen Hawking, who actually found a means by which uh, black holes actually will lose mass. Uh, and that is an uh, interesting thing dealing with quantum mechanics, including uh, antimatter and other fun, exciting things, uh, but again, want to focus on galaxies, we got to get back to it. But uh, with regards to black holes, one more big question, and that is, can I see a black hole? Short answer, no. No, you can't. But you can see something having to do with black holes, and uh, it is worth actually looking at this particular image here. This is an actual image. You may have heard about this one in the news. That image was taken really, well, actually two years ago, but it was published in April. <clears throat> in 2017, a collaboration looking at M87 star, where, a quick note, star is literally uh, just a notation of looking at the galactic core, but uh, the star itself is borrowed from quantum mechanics, where, or in particular nuclear physics, where you can actually have the nucleus of an atom be in an, ex in a, in an excited state, kind of like I'm excited right now, but uh, that excited state is typically denoted with an asterisk. And so when this 
type of object was first discovered at the center of the Milky Way. It was dubbed Sagittarius A star because they were so excited at when, when they realized what it was they had found. And so that excitement is actually referencing the astronomers more so than the object itself. But anyway, Back onto here, yes, the dark center to this object is where that supermassive black hole is, and in this case, it's about 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. Uh, and it's worth noting what kind of galaxy we're looking at here. This is a gigantic elliptical galaxy. Uh, it has no spiral arms. It's very uh, plain looking in many cases. But again, this is about 53 to 55 million light years away in what is called the Virgo cluster. More on that later. Uh, <clears throat> and inside this big, uh, this big galaxy is evidence of a lot of collisions. So it is worth noting that this particular black hole, again, might have actually gotten so large because it ate some other ones. So <clears throat> when it comes to that number there, 55 to, or 53 to 55 million light years away, what we're saying is that it took light, that light that was used in that image, uh, 53 to 55 million years to reach the telescopes. And again, uh, that was 2017, so subtract a couple years, or add a couple years, rather, uh, for that. Um, but <clears throat> so, uh, how'd they actually do that? How'd they make that image? That is not an optical image. It's not made with standard cameras. It's actually a radio image made with what is called the Event Horizon Telescope. What is the Event Horizon Telescope? Well, it's that thing over there. The Event Horizon Telescope is an array of uh, radio telescopes spread over a significant fraction of the planet. Uh, it took over 200 members uh, and 60 different institutions and a collaboration of 20 different countries to really make this happen. Eight different uh, network radio telescopes or arrays were, were worked, uh, worked together using a uh, method called interferometry. And what interferometry allows for is it allows all of the individual radio telescopes to act as one giant dish where the distance between those dishes actually determines the size of the radio dish. And in essence, this spread here allowed for them to create a radio telescope the size of this planet. Well, at least simulate one. But yes, that is what it would take to be able to get the resolution needed to image an event horizon in radio wavelengths is a dish the size of a planet. And this is how they, w they went about actually doing that. So again, the larger the dish, the more detailed you can make that image. And so when it came to actually getting that information, oh goodness, so much information was made. Uh, again, uh, if you have a uh, data plan, you might have a uh, one or two gigs or something like that for uh, your data plan here. You'll have one gig of uh, information you can download. Well, these telescopes, each one of them created on the order of 350 terabytes and one terabyte is 1,000 gigs. So uh, all, the, all of them combined created multiple petabytes of data, where a petabyte is 1,000 terabytes. Uh, and so getting all that data around is not a matter of just you know, going on the internet and clicking send. It's not going to work in your email. You got to do something different with that. You actually, in general, for that amount of data, they had to literally use good old sneaker net. Uh, that is literally use the sneakers on your feet. You actually carry this data around, which meant it actually took a long time to just get the data together. After all, SPT stands for South Pole Telescope. Uh, it is down in Antarctica, and when this imaging was done, well, they couldn't just leave immediately. They had to wait for the end of winter uh, so they could leave that site there. And once they got all of that information together, if you actually transferred it around, you would be part of setting the record for fastest data transfer in history. Just moving the hard drives around that this information was on was record breaking. And that said, it took a long time to process the data. And in fact, it took about two years to do that. And that's how we got that image that you saw on the last slide, that one right back here. That image there is again a radio image 
the coloration there is uh, just meant to show different temperatures as detected by the radio telescopes. And so there's a lot of detail that can be talked about here. The brighter part of that has to do with uh, relativistic beaming, that is material moving near the speed of light, actually causing it to appear brighter. That is part of an accretion disk, material actually orbiting around that black hole, and the black hole itself being about uh, the size of our solar system. So uh, again, that is a wonderful result from this team, and it is worth spending this time talking about supermassive black holes when we're talking about galaxies, because this is something we find, again, almost in every single large galaxy we look at. And so it is a ubiquitous thing for understanding the mechanics of galaxies. Anyway, uh, so that is wonderful results, and I'm very excited about that discovery. And I literally knew when they took that data back in 2017, I've been waiting for two years for that picture. I was so excited when it came out. All right, <clears throat> but let's go back to larger scales because uh, while galaxies technically exist in the vacuum, uh, there's uh, plenty of other things in that vacuum. And in particular, we can actually see structures and uh, larger groupings and clusterings of galaxies. And in fact, galaxy groups and clusters are actually the largest known gravitationally bound objects in existence, period. That is what we're finding when we actually look out in the universe. We see structures of uh, large numbers of galaxies put together, and groups and clusters are actually defined as two very different things. Uh, galaxy groups are worth actually talking about in uh, very specific terms. Usually, you could say up to about 50 galaxies to define a galaxy, but uh, if you want to be more... Uh, more distinct and more uh, precise, you could actually instead refer to the amount of material there, and that is 80 trillion solar masses or less by a group definition, uh, and that works out really well for our local group of galaxies. We are uh, well under that, uh, that value there, so we're in a nice group, even though we have about 50 or 40 to 50, uh, 40 to 54, somewhere in that range of uh, galaxies in our local group. And I want to show you what this looks like. Uh, this won't show all of them because it doesn't show some of the dimmer ones. But uh, what I want to do is actually make a nice map by putting a nice grid on this thing. And we are about, uh, we are right about here. And now moving out, you can actually see Magellanic clouds. And as we spin around, you can see the Andromeda galaxy down there with the Triangulum galaxy hanging out by it. As we're going out, you might be able to see this is going out to a radius of about 8 million light years. That means it takes light 8 million years to reach us from the edge of this ring. Uh, so we can see there's a few galaxies here. Uh, it, again, you aren't seeing all of them because there are a lot more very dim uh, dwarf galaxies. We're looking only at the largest galaxies by and large here, uh, again, with Andromeda being uh, down here with uh, Triangulum. And as we zoom back in, you can see the large and small Magellanic clouds off to the side there. That is the majority of what we see in our local group of galaxies. There's not that much all that nearby. So in contrast, there are clusters. How are clusters set up? Well, they're, you could say, approximately twice as massive. Uh, but again, uh, that has some very dramatic variance depending on which groups and clusters you're comparing. So uh, nevertheless, they are still held together by mutual gravitational uh, attraction, which again, going back to good old Fritz Zwicky, he was able to notice that the actual motions of these galaxies wouldn't actually make them gravitationally bound. They're moving too fast. And that is based on luminous mass, looking at the stars and estimating how much material is there by how bright uh, those objects are. So that implies, again, that dark matter actually influencing how these things are more massive than they literally appear. So, all right, what does a cluster actually look like? Well, there's a nearby cluster. Uh, it has at its center a familiar object. This is M87. This is the galaxy that we were just talking about having a supermassive black hole about 6.5 times or 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun at its center. It is one of the central dominant galaxies in the Virgo cluster of galaxies, which has on the order of around 200. 
thousand galaxies in it. So we'll zoom out to the same radius we were looking at before, that eight million light year uh, distance. And as you can see, there are a lot more galaxies here. <clears throat> there is a variety of different types, which we'll talk about more. But yes, this actually doesn't completely encompass the entirety of this cluster. So what we're going to actually have to do is we're going to actually have to keep zooming out. So we'll go ahead and do that here. And you can see a few more galaxies popping in there. And as we zoom out further, you'll actually see a couple of little groups on the edge, like down here. These are a couple of other galactic groups. Uh, but yeah, this is what a cluster of galaxies looks like. This is not where we will stop even though the video stops right about there. <clears throat> All right, so this is a cluster, but there are super clusters. Super clusters themselves can actually encompass other clusters and groups, and in fact, uh, when we're looking around the, gal the universe, these are among the largest structures we see ever, and when we're looking at things here, we can actually see the Milky Way is a member of the local group, which is a member of the Virgo supercluster. As we have looked out at how these galaxies are moving around us, the Virgo supercluster, which includes the Virgo cluster of galaxies, uh, it, the Virgo supercluster includes about that area over there. Um, the uh, Laniakea is the proposed name for actually the overall supercluster of this region. Uh, it basically means uh, big sky or big open sky. It's from Hawaiian. It was so the name was chosen. I'm not sure if the IAU has actually adopted it yet, but uh, the name was chosen to actually honor Polynesian uh, navigators who use the stars to move around the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so it's a uh, great name in my opinion, and it is a very large object. Again, about 500 million light years across. This is about the largest. Again, the largest scale structures we see. Beyond this scale, we start to see more uniformity, but uh, more on the overall scale of the universe in just a minute. Again, when we look at the overall universe, though, we think there's around 10 million of these inside the observable universe, these super clusters of galaxies. So, okay, well, let's go back and actually think about the different types of galaxies we saw, the different uh, different properties of them and such, and ask ourselves, well, where do we find those different types? And this leads to a fun thing called the morphology density relation. Again, morphology is the study of shape, and what we're saying is there is a relationship between the shape of a galaxy and the galactic density, how many galaxies are crammed into a given volume. So, uh, what are we actually saying? Well, again, Say we take a big cube of galaxies, say about uh, three, well, again, uh, 3 again 3.26 million light years on a side, and we actually count the number of galaxies that are inside it. What we actually find is again early, uh, not not actually younger, uh, but early type galaxies, the ellipticals and the lenticulars, often inhabit more highly dense regions, uh, and late type galaxies occur more by themselves. That's why. We actually happen to be both in a group, a relatively low dense environment, and in a spiral galaxy. Neighboring large galaxy, also a spiral galaxy. We're in a relatively low dense environment. Uh, but there's a few things that actually drive this. Uh, one such thing actually has to do with, uh, in general, you've got a lot more interaction of these galaxies that drives up star formation. And the big thing that actually gives detail, as you'll recall, to those spiral arms is actually density of the gas and the ability to form stars. That is what drives those particular shapes. If you're not forming a lot of stars, you're not going to have spiral structure. And as such, you can end up with more elliptical and lenticular galaxies in those environments. But there's another thing that happens in dense environments that I wanted to talk about when we were talking about irregular galaxies, but uh, we'll mention that now, and that is galaxy collisions. Galaxy collisions are always fun to talk about. I love this video because it shows one singular simulation and stops it at multiple places to show actual pictures of galaxy collisions. So there's our first example there. Now, when a galaxy collides, it's a really 
interesting thing. It is not all that violent. Uh, in fact, there's so much space in between stars that in general, in galaxy collisions, not a single star collides with another star. That is how much space is there. So we end up with these intricate, beautiful dances of, of these uh, galaxies interacting, but there is something that does collide, and that's the uh, big clouds of gas and dust. And as we were talking about earlier, with increased density comes increased star formation. And so in many cases where we look at irregular galaxies, we find really dramatic star formation. You'll see all of those really bright blue regions in these images where you have big bright stars and you'll see a lot of reds where you have bright emission nebula where new stars are being born. This is what it looks like when galaxies collide and again, in many places, uh, where this, what this will result in is over time, you can actually expect that gas and dust to be consumed largely in those collisions because of all the increased star formation, and eventually you can expect it to settle down into an elliptical galaxy. So it might make sense that at least part of the reason we see so many, uh, so many elliptical galaxies in higher density environments is because there's been some collisions in the past. So, <clears throat> all right, that's great. We got, can see how those galaxies will change shape in some cases, but how'd they even get here to begin with? Well, uh, it's worth noting that we had some ideas for a while, and it all comes back to this notion, uh, or the answer to this uh, big question came back to what is called the Hubble Deep Field. And again, by 1995, we had actually figured out some ideas on how galaxies might have formed, and some theories actually uh, uh, indicated that they might have actually formed recently, while others suggested they might have formed pretty early in the formation of the universe. There's just one big problem with trying to actually answer which one of those is right. What we would actually need to do is get the Hubble Space Telescope to spend about 10 straight days staring at one part of the sky, and that is really expensive. It is really expensive, and that telescope at the time, again, 1995, that is the only premier telescope that could answer this question and could answer many, many other questions. So what did it take to actually uh, get this image? Well, again, there is big risk involved because if those galaxies formed recently, staring at one place in the night sky for 10 days would just yield basically an empty image. It would look like what's on the right side of the screen there. So to answer this question, what happened was the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, he has his own discretionary time where he can actually generally offer up that time to people who want to study supernova because supernova occur suddenly and we need to actually just give them that time very rapidly. But in 1995, what he actually did is he put almost all of that discretionary time into this purpose, those 10 days just looking at that part of the sky, because guess what? Who else is actually in a position to risk this? If you went to some other institute and they actually applied for this, they would be uh, very afraid to put that application forward because guess who actually has to pay for it? They have to get the grants for it and actually make it happen. Kind of needed to be the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute to really make this happen. And the result was astounding. This image here is the, uh, is the Hubble Deep Field image. At the time when they first published, they said there's probably about 1,500 galaxies there. The count is actually over 3,000. Uh, and when looking at this very empty part of the sky, they only had about 20 stars in it. So everything you're seeing over there just about is a galaxy, a collection of on the order of... Uh, on the order of maybe 100 billion stars in each of those little fuzzy points of light. Now, it's worth knowing what part of the sky this actually filled. And so I have a question for you. How many of you guys actually uh, saw this sign uh, when you were in here? I want to see a show of hands. All right, great. How many of you actually went back and found the line at the back that I put down to actually find this dime? Uh, you got time afterwards to find it because what I actually did was I put a uh, dime on the wall there and in the original publication about this, they said that this, uh, the area of the sky we're looking at is the equivalent to looking at the area of the sky covered by a dime 75 feet away. 
And so what I did is I measured out 75 feet from that wall over there. I taped up a dime on the wall. So if you want to see how much of the sky uh, this image is referring to, go ahead and check that out on your way out uh, this evening. It is very worth doing. It is uh, quite a perspective. But yes, so that is the Hubble Deep Field image. Why is this so important? Well, again, it tells us largely how we can actually, it narrows down dramatically how galaxies could have formed because we're looking most of the way back to the beginning of the universe here because we see just so many uh, galaxies here. <clears throat> and it's been referred to as, uh, some people have referred to it as the double helix of astronomy. It is literally as groundbreaking as the discovery of the double helix in DNA. Uh, there's a number of other comparisons people like to make but failing to remember them because I just love looking at this picture. But, uh, <clears throat> so this is dramatic and it informs us as to one of the mechanisms by which galaxies might have formed and it's worth actually backtracking to before what we can see here and actually looking back at, uh, at literally the beginning of the universe. Again, we're talking galaxy formation and what we need to have these galaxies form is to have a heterogeneous universe. What does that mean? Well, what it means is we, or to get a heterogeneous universe, we need to get to there from a homogeneous one, one that is very, very uniform. Why? Well, because when we looked up at the sky using uh, radio telescopes initially, we found uh, what is called the cosmic microwave background, and that image over there is an, uh, a way of showing how uniform it was. The uh, overall way of actually showing any detail there yeah, it, it all looks like one categorized color. That color map is not showing much variance. In other words, the big stripe across the middle of that, that is uh, actually the Milky Way put in there. So that is uh, not showing variance in the cosmic microwave background. That's showing local variance in the radio environment. So what we need to actually make this work is to actually have quantum mechanical fluctuations when the universe is really small that actually causes some shifts in the density. It doesn't have to be dramatic, but it has to be sufficient. And in fact, when we go back and look at that cosmic microwave background and use a more detailed view of it and actually uh, uh, don't just uh, look at it on a big scale, we have to look at it at the smallest variances. And then we get to see this. This is from uh, WMAP and it is showing a difference in its color map from the darkest regions to the highest regions is a temp temperature difference of about 200 micro Kelvin. That is, again, uh, literally uh, hundreds of millionths of a degree Celsius is the actual full, uh, full difference up there. What does that actually even mean? Well, what it means is that some of the areas that are hotter are actually ever so slightly more dense than the regions that are colder. Why is this important? Because a change in density means you actually have areas that have a higher gravitational pull than others. And that uh, leads us to actually start talking about how these things might go from there. The top-down model is to say, okay, maybe you actually have big glass gas clouds themselves be the thing that actually comes down and uh, breaks up to form galaxies in, uh, into a bunch of galaxies, or you could actually have smaller clumps at, in, that, in that difference in density come together to form a lot of galaxies. And what does that last one look like? Well, it looks a little bit more like this simulation here. You've got slight variances, and inside those slight variances you have very high densities suddenly form, and each of those points is representative of a galaxy. You've got a cluster of galaxies forming right in front of us here with a dramatic web of material extending beyond it. This is a simulation of what we're talking about for overall view of the universe, and what does this result in? It results in something that is sometimes referred to as the cosmic web. This is another simulation. All the bright points of light there would be where you have uh, lots of galaxies. The uh, dimmer areas are the lower density areas, uh, and there are full-fledged voids in between it. This is often compared to as being similar to a 
big old set of soap bubbles where all the galaxies would be on the main areas where soap bubbles are, are joined together, uh, where the soap actually is, and then there would be big gaps of air in between them. And so this is the large scale of the universe. This is what we actually see out there. But again, uh, this being a simulation specifically, but when we actually look out there, we don't necessarily spot all these details so readily because we're just looking at galaxies. We don't have an ability to highlight different things as we have in a simulation here. So it ends up looking a little bit different, but we can still find evidence of this kind of structure when we look out in the universe. All right, so the grandest scale, once again, we've got vast filaments of material, uh, galaxies themselves spread out around uh, dramatic voids, and then we have a number of, again, early type galaxies, those uh, ellipticals and uh, the others being where you have the higher density, that is based on that density morphology relation, and again, uh, late type galaxies would be out more in the voids and along the, uh, the dimmer parts of the filaments, and our own Milky Way kind of is closer to one of those voids where we have an individual group. Uh, and this is a big, another thing we would love to spend more time on, but uh, the actual bubbles themselves, they're getting bigger, everything is expanding outward, and uh, that expansion is actually accelerating due to something called dark energy. Uh, and so, a lot more detail there, but uh, that'll be for another time. <clears throat> All right. So, looking way out into the future, what can we actually see? Well, what can we see is we can actually expect that in about four and a half billion years, the Andromeda galaxy is actually coming closer to us. Why? Well, because that expansion I mentioned, it is on very large scales. On smaller scales, galaxies have their own initial velocities, and the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxy's initial velocities are taking us together. Uh, and that will result in a very dramatic merger uh, but as the universe expands further and further out and faster and faster, you're at a wonderful time in the universe right now. We can see that cosmic microwave background. Eventually, the universe will expand so much that we'll actually lose sight of that. And in fact, we'll start losing sight of the most distant galaxies as well. And then finally, in the very, very distant future, when uh, humanity might not even be referred to as humanity, uh, we can actually expect that the... Uh, that our uh, eventual descendants would be living in a, uh, a, what appears to be a singular island in this island universe. Uh, that is the combined uh, combination of uh, the Andromeda and the Milky Way. It's, it'll be an interesting time frame. By that point, we won't be hanging out by the sun because the sun will be dead. Uh, but it'll be an interesting time nonetheless. Uh, but... Where we are now is very, very different. Once again, coming back to the present, I want to wrap things up by noting one thing in particular, and that is that when we're looking at galaxies, these island universes, this is a simulated view of the Milky Way. It's not exact, but uh, nonetheless, uh, when we're looking at these types of galaxies, Say we actually wanted to see how much time we could spend looking at everything here. The Milky Way has on the order of 100 to 400 billion stars in it. If you had one year of the, or if you spent one year at each of those stars and you were able to do so for the entire existence of the universe at about 13.8 billion years, you'd probably be only about a tenth of the way going to visit every star in our galaxy. Now, this is our galaxy. Our galaxy, again, has just about everything you expect to find in the universe on the small scale. It is, once again, one of many island universes in this big universe. As we zoom out here, we can see a variety of other things. That in the background is the uh, Virgo cluster. Those are the Magellanic Clouds. As we go out here, down here is the Andromeda Galaxy right there. And as we go out, we'll revisit that Virgo cluster where M87 is. It will pass right in front of us here. There it goes, right there. This is our universe. Our universe is not empty. Our universe is so incredibly filled, we can't even comprehend the ability to visit the majority of it. This is where we are in a vast archipelago of 100 billion island universes. This is where we are, and thank you for being here. <laughs>